We're continuing our study of the topology of the real number line, and here we're gonna look at something called a perfect set. So a subset P of the real numbers is called perfect if it's closed and has no isolated points. And I wanna recall what an isolated point is real quick. So an element A from a set A is called isolated if it is not a limit point of A. Or by negating the definition of a limit point, we can just say that there exists some epsilon bigger than zero such that the epsilon neighborhood centered at A intersected with A only contains A. Remember, in order to have a, be a limit point, you have to contain something other than the center of the epsilon neighborhood. But here we only contain that center. So the theorem that we're going to prove in this video is that every non-empty perfect set is uncountable. And our main tool will be this theorem involving the intersection of nested non-empty compact sets. So I'll let you guys look that up if you need to recall that. It's in a couple of videos ago. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the proof here. So we're going to do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, suppose that P is a subset of real numbers is perfect and countable. And then we'll get some sort of contradiction and the contradiction will contradict this and statement, which means it's either not perfect or not countable. In other words, uncountable. So notice that the fact that it is countable means that there exists some bijection We'll call it f from the natural numbers 1 to 1 and on to p. Great. And now if we go ahead and set p sub i equal to f evaluated at i, that allows us to write this set p as p1, p2, p3, and so on and so forth. So now we've got a list of every element in this set p. OK, great. Now we want to start building that nested sequence of compact sets. And we're going to do that in the following way. So let's let I1, so this is going to be an interval, and we're going to say it has endpoints A1 and B1 contain P1 with P1 is not equal to A1 or B1. So in other words, P1 is in the interior of this closed interval. So let's maybe get a picture going real quick. So let's say here we have A1, here we have B1. So this, what that I'm doing in yellow right here is my interval I1. And then P1 is just somewhere in between there. Great. And now we're going to use the fact that P1 is not an isolated point. Well, so P1 is in P, which we're assuming to be a perfect set. And perfect sets do not have isolated points. So P1 is not isolated. In other words, it's a limit point. But what that tells us is that there exists some sort of x2, which is not equal to p1, which is inside this interval um, a1, comma b1. And it's in this set. And it's in this set p. Great. And so like I said, that's because p1 will be a limit point of p, or in other words, a non-isolated point of p. Now the next thing that we want to do is build an interval which is nested inside of this interval I1. So let's see how we can do that. So let's go ahead and set, I'm going to call this thing epsilon over 2. And so this is going to be the minimum of a bunch of different numbers. So we're going to have x2 minus a1, and I might as well go ahead and put x2 in this interval because we're assuming that it's in the interval and the perfect set. So x2 minus a1, that's this distance right here. And then b1 minus x2, that's going to be this distance right here. And then we also want the distance between p1 and x2. But we don't know what order those are in, so we'll just say the absolute value of p1 minus x2. 
So that's my epsilon. It's gonna be the minimum of all of those numbers. But now I can build a new interval. So let's go ahead and set A2 equal to X2 minus epsilon over two. I guess I should say epsilon two over two. And then we're gonna set B2 equal to X2 plus epsilon two over two. So in other words, this is the epsilon over two neighborhood of X2. Great. But now what we noticed is because epsilon two is the minimum of all three of these and we've taken half of it, that if we construct an interval which we'll call I2, which is A2 comma B2, we'll have that is inside of I1. Great, so let's sketch out exactly what I2 looks like in this case. So in our setup, the minimum of all of these by our picture is this distance between X2 and P1. So we'll take that distance, take half of it, and then make an epsilon neighborhood around X2. So this will be my A2 and my B2. And so this that is in purple, is my interval I2. So I've got this nesting already occurring. And then the basic idea, which we're gonna write down more carefully on the next board, is you keep at this. Now notice since X2 is inside of P, it's going to be a non-isolated point. So you can similarly construct an I3 that's contained inside of I2 and then so on and so forth. Okay, so I'll go ahead and clean this up and I will sketch out exactly how to iterate this process. So now we want to iteratively continue this process that we did on the last board. So I'm gonna go ahead and let I sub N equal A sub N comma B sub N. And then we also have some number X sub N, which is inside of A sub N comma B sub N, and it's inside of P. So this is constructed like we did on the last board, but just a little bit more generally. So now we can use the fact that X N is not isolated to find something called an X N plus one inside of this closed interval a n b n intersect p which that x n plus one is not equal to x n now what i want to do is construct my next interval and i'll do that in exactly the same way as i got everything started okay so i'm going to look at a sub n and b sub n and so this interval right here is my original i sub n interval so by our iterative construction, we know that it contains this X sub N. And then by the fact that P is perfect and so it doesn't have any isolated points, we also know that it contains this X sub N plus one, which is an, another element from P. Okay, so now what we would like to do is construct an interval which is completely contained in this interval does not have x sub n plus one and also does not have one of the elements that is important for our upcoming contradiction from the perfect set. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we'll do is set epsilon n plus one equal to the minimum of a bunch of distances. And these are the distances. So we'll have x sub n plus one minus a sub n. So that's gonna be the distance from x sub n plus one and the left-hand endpoint. b sub n minus x sub n plus one. So that's the distance from the right-hand endpoint to x sub n plus one. Good, and then finally, the distance between p sub n and x sub n plus one. Now we don't know exactly where P sub N lies. It might be in this interval, but it might not be in this interval. But all we wanna do is bound this point in a closed interval away from P sub N. So that's really important. And recall this P1, P2, P3, and so on and so forth. Though That was our list of our perfect set. Okay, so now the next thing that we wanna do is create our new endpoints. So we'll set a sub n plus one equal to x sub n plus one minus epsilon n plus one over two. And then b sub n plus one will be x sub n plus one plus epsilon n plus, n, n plus one over two. Okay, 
So let's sketch out what that is. So just right about here will be my a sub n plus one and right about here will be my b sub n plus one. So this thing that I'm shading in blue will be what I now call the interval i sub n plus one. So that's a n plus one comma b n plus one. Great, so I'll underline that in blue to go along with that shading there, right? So now I wanna make the following two observations. So the first observation is that P sub N is not an element of I sub N plus one because we've bound that distance away. So notice that epsilon N plus one is less than that distance right there, but our interval has radius epsilon n plus one over two. So there's no way that P sub n can be inside of this I sub n plus one. Okay, good. And then another thing that we notice is that I sub n plus one is a sub interval of I sub n. And that's gonna be true for all n. Actually, both of these are true for all n bigger than or equal to one. Okay, so I'll go ahead and bring that up and then we will work towards the end. So let's see what we've done so far. We have constructed nested non-empty closed intervals that have this property that Pn is not in In plus one. And let's just go ahead and recall that here we've made the assumption that P is this list, P1, P2, P3, and so on and so forth. Great. Now I wanna build some compact sets that are also nested. So let's go ahead and set kn equal to i sub n intersect p. Now p is a perfect set, then the fact that it's a perfect set means it's closed. i sub n is closed and bounded, so that makes the intersection also closed and bounded. So let's go ahead and write that, closed and bounded. But we proved earlier that that means that it is compact. That's how we want to think about compact sets of real numbers. So we've got Kn is compact. Then by this nesting right here, I1 contains I2, contains I3, and so forth, we have K1 contains the set K2, which contains the set K3, and so on and so forth. But then we've got this nested compact set, inter compact set theorem which says that the intersection as n goes from one to infinity of k sub n is non-empty. So we proved that a couple of videos ago. But this is going to be a problem because of the following. So but for p sub n in p, and remember that's a way to represent every element of p, we have p sub n is not in k sub n plus one by the construction of k sub n plus one, but that tells us that p sub n is not in the intersection, n equals one to infinity of k sub n. So what we have is none of the elements of p are in k sub n, are in this intersection. But because of the construction of k sub n, this intersection is a subset of P. So maybe let's go ahead and write that down, but this intersection is a subset of P. So what we have is that none of the elements of P are in this subset of P, but what that makes is the intersection equal to the empty set. So let's see what we have. We have by the nested compact set theorem, this intersection is not the empty set, but then by our construction of all of these compact sets, this intersection is the empty set. So we have reached a contradiction. And what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this original assumption up here that P was countable in the first place. So P is not countable. In other words, P must be uncountable. And that's a good place to stop.